Good morning, good morning. morning. How are you today? (laughs) I knew Robert cannot resist that, so I have to ask that question. It's a blessing to be here, and I truly believe that, that the Lord has been leading in the preparation of this message because it's been going along with the Sabbath school quarterly, with the conversations we've had at prayer meeting, with the conversations we had um, in Sabbath school this morning, Vespers last night. I really truly believe the Lord is, is trying to speak to me and to us as a whole. And so you see the title here is Give Them Something to Eat. So we're going to talk a little bit about hunger and responsibility, if that's okay. Let's uh, pray one more time. Dear Jesus, I pray that today you give us something to eat. I pray that right now you help us to have something to chew on, to process, and to think through for the rest of our week and the rest of our lives. Please continue to guide us and lead us, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So we talked in Sabbath school about hungry people, and um, we talked a little bit specifically about homeless people, and it reminded me, this wasn't originally part of the message, but it reminded me of one of the moments where I stopped seeing homeless people as a group, and I started learning to see them as individual people. Um, Early on after Kyra and I got married, I, I don't remember our conversation at the time, but I know that one of the things we talked about was we just wanted... We wanted to go wherever God led us. We wanted to do whatever he asked us to do. We wanted to help the homeless. We wanted to do all these things, right? We had these great ideals. And one day we were driving in Portland, Maine, and we drove past a homeless man with a sign out. And I felt this tug to stop, but I was driving, and it was not very convenient to stop. It wasn't a very convenient place to be. So I kept driving, and Kyra looked at me and said, why didn't you stop? I said, well, you know, I, it's, it's too long. I came up with all these excuses. I don't know. Like, I just don't. The reality was I didn't want to, right? Even though I said that I wanted to help people, when I saw it, it was presented in front of me. I didn't really want to do it because it was going to be uncomfortable and different and weird, stretch my comfort zone. But Kyra, for whatever reason, kept pushing me on this. And so she made me stop and turn around. So I stopped and turned around, and I got out of my car, and I started talking to this man. And I wanted to know his story. And so I wanted to know his name and why he was out there. So I got to know him. His name was Eddie. Not this Eddie up here uh, with this family, but this Eddie up in Maine. And um, Eddie was from Kenya originally. And as he was speaking to me, he shared this was um, a little bit... Now, I can't remember the year exactly, but this was several years later. He said that he had originally been working, he had a house, he was doing well, and then 9-11 happened. And after 9-11, he felt that there had been some racism that had taken place. There was some distrust between him and his landlord, and eventually he got kicked out and evicted. And so after he was evicted, people weren't really helping. And it's very expensive to live in Portland, Maine, by the way. And so he simply just didn't have a lot of money. And he had several steps downward after that. You know what was incredible, though, about my time talking with Eddie? Not only did I feel sad for him and his situation, I came to understand him better. But Eddie knew the word. Eddie knew scripture. And Eddie started ministering to me. He started talking to me about faith. He started talking to me about generosity. And I started realizing this is not a one-way relationship with me helping someone lower than me. But this was an interrelationship where I had something to offer Eddie because I had resources that he did not. And he had something to offer me because he had faith that I did not. And that was a good reminder to me. That every person that I drive past, like we've talked about, every person that I go by or I see out on the street or having, living in a tent, they have a story. They are individual people. And if I'm willing to, not only can I be a blessing to them, but they can be a blessing to me as well. And that brings me to this idea of hunger. Eddie was physically hungry. And um, I think at the time I was also spiritually hungry. And we gave each other something to eat. Have you ever been hungry? Like, I, I want to hear this. That we, can do, we can do some participation for a minute. What's the longest you've gone without food? Raise your hand if you think you've gone 
quite some time without food. What's the longest you've gone? An hour. Yes, when you're growing, an hour seems like forever. Uh, yes, ma'am. Three days. Three days as well. Has anyone gone more than three days without food? Yes, ma'am. One week. One week without food. Wow. There's a level of hunger that you get to that when we go an hour, when we miss a meal, when we miss a day, we can't relate to that type of hunger. One time during my training, uh, so originally I was studying international rescue and relief, and I had this training, and in this training we had to do survival. So we had to go out in the woods, and all we had was a knife and a water filter and a water bottle, and we had to survive for three days. And guess what? I survived, but I did not eat. I couldn't find any food. And so for 72 hours, I had to be out in the woods with no food. And man, it changed my whole perspective. The reason why they wanted us to do that, by the way, was they wanted us to know what it was like to be lost in the woods. They wanted us to know what it was like when you're out there scared and alone and unprepared and you just don't have anything for you, right? Because you know what you're supposed to do when you're lost. What are you supposed to do when you're lost out in the woods? Stay in one place, right? So people can come find you. That sounds like good advice until you're the one that has to stay in one place out in the woods. And nighttime comes. And then daylight comes. And nobody's there. And so 24 hours of the 72, I had to spend within six feet of one tree. Because they said, you, you got to learn what it means to stay in one place. That was the longest 24 hours of my entire life. And the thing about being hungry is as, as you get empty, it empties your, your emotional capacity as well. You, you get brain fog for a while, and then tears start coming. I remember crying and not really sure why I was crying, because I was hungry. And so I learned a little tiny bit about hunger, not like a week long. And we know people go much longer than that sometimes without food. So I learned a little bit about hunger, and I have a question. Are there hungry people around us? Let's look at this in both ways. Are there spiritually hungry people around us? Everywhere, everywhere, and many of them don't even know what they're hungering for, but they are hungry, hungry people. Are there physically hungry people around us? Even here in the U.S., in the land of plenty, do we have hungry people? Here's my challenge to you. Give these people something to eat, the spiritually hungry and the physically hungry. You give them something to eat. That's the whole perspective here. Have you ever wondered uh, why you're in the situation you're in? Have you ever asked God, God, why am I stuck in this job? Or, God, why don't I have a job? I've been trying to get a job for so long. Or, why is everything falling apart around me? Have you ever asked God why you're in the situation that you're in at all? Raise your hand if you've ever asked God those things. I want to ask you a question, or no, I want to make a suggestion here. What if the reason you're in the situation that you're in isn't even about you at all? What if it's about someone else? What if God is using your challenges and your misfortune to put someone else in your path for you to give something to eat? Are you with me? What if it's not about you at all? What if we walk through our lives looking for the people that God is putting in our path? What might that look like? That's what we're going to look at here in Mark chapter 6. Maybe God has us in the exact place and time that we are for us to give someone something to eat. Mark chapter 6. And today I want you to, to uh, if you're willing, put on your imagination hat, all right? I know some of us love imagination. Some of us are not very good at it. I want you to practice today. I want you to imagine being one of the disciples of Jesus at this time. I want you to imagine that you've been traveling along with him for some time now, okay? And in the context of the story in Mark chapter 6, you see at the, at the uh, verse 6 and onward, 6 to 13, is the story I just shared with the children. So you have just gone out. Imagine how scary that probably was, right? You're expected not to take anything with you, and now you have to go do what Jesus did. You have to 
perform miracles. But you come back, we know the story is that you come back and you were successful. But you're probably pretty exhausted because it was a trying time, right? You had to go around to all of these different towns and villages and preach and teach and uh, have authority that you don't think you deserve to have. And you come back and you're tired, you're empty, you've, you've been ministering for this whole time. Well, look at verse 14 to 29. Not only are you tired and exhausted and, and overwhelmed by the trip you just took, but what just happened? John the Baptist died. Now, for us, we know this story, so it's not that big of a shock to us, right? But to those disciples at that time, John the Baptist, he's the one, right? He's the one who prepared the way for Jesus. He is the, the biggest light, true light in the entire nation, pointing to the truth of Jesus. And he's the one that we think is going to prepare the way for Jesus to come along and to finally sit as the king of Israel. And he lost his head. So this is upending everything that we thought was going to be okay, right? Because we trusted that God had this plan in place, and the plan involved John the Baptist, and now John the Baptist was beaten down by the Romans. He was imprisoned, and then he lost his life. So not only are you exhausted from your own trip, you come back and this news hits, and now you're in mourning, and you're confused, right? You're overwhelmed. There's probably a lot of questions if you're one of these disciples. You're saying, why? Why is all of this happening? I don't understand any of this, Jesus. It doesn't make sense. This is where we jump in, in verse 30. You come back, the apostles gathered around him and reported to him all they had done and taught. You're excited. You want to tell, you know, I actually said something and I said it in the name of Jesus and guess what? The demon left. Can you believe it? And the next person is like, no, no, but you don't understand. You don't understand. This man, he had a broken leg from birth, and he couldn't walk. And then I ministered to him, and I prayed, and I saw his leg be healed. What? And they're excited and overwhelmed, but they're also, you can see the exhaustion on their face. If you've ever done sustained ministry, you know it's a very emotionally trying time, right? And so... It says in verse 31, then because so many people were coming and going, they didn't even have a chance to eat. He said to them, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. Notice, the disciples were hungry, right? The disciples themselves were hungry. I think this is a key part of this whole story. So Jesus says, okay, we got to take care of ourselves, right? Self-care is important. Come on, we're going to go somewhere else. We need to recharge. And that was, I think, the actual intention. Because you see what happens, they, they go away by boat to a solitary place. So they hop in a boat, they get on the lake, and they start heading in a direction, and the people start following the boat. They say, I think I know where they're going to land. They're going to be over here. And so all the people are running along the shoreline or taking these little back ways, these little shortcuts, and they end up on the beach as this boat pulls up. Can you imagine how frustrated you might be in this moment? You're tired. You're hungry, you're ready for self-care, and now there's this crowd, and I know, I know that half the disciples are like, Jesus, please send them away. Please, like, I need a break. This is too much going on. Verse 33, many who saw them leaving recognized them and ran on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. In 34, when Jesus landed, he saw this crowd, and what happened? This is a continual theme in the Gospels. It says he had compassion on them. And another one uh, I was reading uh, in, in Matthew, and uh, I posted to Facebook, like a, a, some, of the, some of the Greek words had these powerful meanings. You know, it says that Jesus saw them and they were like sheep without a shepherd. And the words uh, could mean mangled and cast aside. He sees these people, this crowd, and they're just so pitiful. It's so sad, the suffering they're going through. Jesus thinks to himself, I cannot possibly, I can't leave them. I've got to help. Right? But you're a disciple. You're not Jesus. And you haven't gone through the whole process with Jesus. So you're thinking, I'm tired. I need a nap. I'm getting hangry, Jesus. It's time to go. Right? Right? He has compassion because they were like sheep without a shepherd, so he began teaching them many things. 
and he spends the day with him, with them. And I'm sure the disciples are trying to be positive. They're trying to be, um, you know, joyful. They're excited about what just happened. They're not in like the worst shape of their lives. Things are okay, but they're hungry and they're tired and they need space. Normal human needs, right? And so it's getting late in the day, the sun's going down, and they're not anywhere near a Kroger or a Walmart, right? And if you remember what has happened, these people did not plan to meet Jesus here. They got excited. So they haven't planned ahead. They haven't been very responsible. So they didn't bring their food along with them. They're here. They're hungry. The disciples are hungry. They're overwhelmed. The whole situation's kind of going to maybe go off track if we're not careful. And so the disciples come up with a very realistic plan right? A very reasonable plan. They weren't being unkind here, but it's getting late. The sun's going down, and besides Jesus, you told us we're supposed to come away and be by ourselves right now, right? So they say, this is a remote place, and it's already very late. Here's our solution, Jesus. Why don't you send the people away so that they can go to the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. Look, if they just go down, I don't know, five miles and turn right, there's a McDonald's right there, they can go grab some food, right? Let them go do what they need to do. We need to take care of ourselves, and it's time. We've been ministering this whole time. It's time. Let us have our time. Why are we in the situation that we're in? Verse 37 is the power of the whole thing. Jesus answers to them, and what does he say? You give them something to eat. And when you say this, you give them something to eat, what's the first question that we're probably going to pop up? How? Right? we got to think logistics here. How in the world am I going to give them something to eat? There's a crowd of 5,000 men here, plus women and children. So we're looking at probably 15,000 people. We didn't even have food for ourselves. Remember, Jesus, we were hungry at the beginning of the day. Remember that part? And you're telling me to feed them, I don't have any food. How can I feed them? The how is a very reasonable question, right? I think we ask this question a lot, don't we? We don't have the resources, Jesus, to do what you're asking us to do. We don't have the time, Jesus, to do it. This would be a logistical nightmare. We talked in Sabbath school about the suffering people around us, and it gets overwhelming, doesn't it? How? How could we really provide for all of these people? It's a reasonable question. You could even say, how can I feed them when I'm the hungry one? How? And so Jesus, I mean, they respond to Jesus with a reasonable question. That would take more than a half year's wages. That's what they're saying. This would take six months' salary. And if you forgot, Jesus, you're not paying me a salary. I don't have the money. I can't go down to McDonald's and buy them all burgers. I don't have it. How are you expecting me to do what you're asking me to do? Are we to go and spend that much on bread and give it to them to eat? And Jesus asks a very insightful question. How many loaves do you have? In other words, what he's asking in a broad way is what do you have? He's not asking you what don't you have. He's saying what do you have? Are you with me? Jesus is going to ask you to do things that you're going to say, how, right? I don't have what it takes. That's very common. Everybody in Scripture pretty much did the same thing. How? I'm too young. How? I can't speak right. How? I don't have the money for this. How? I don't have the time, right? That's a common question, but Jesus continually brings it back to you and says, what do you have? Show me what you have. I can work with it, right? I don't care if you don't think it's enough. Give me what you got. And so that's what happens. How many loaves do you have? He says, go and see. And so they go through the crowd. And again, imagine you are one of these disciples, and you got to go through these, this crowd, and you're asking, hey, do you guys have any food? Now, that's a very awkward question to be asking, isn't it? You're asking them for resources because you don't have any for yourself. Hey, do you have any food? Finally, they find some kid, and the kid's like, uh, yeah, I brought lunch, and I didn't want it, right? <laughs> mom, mom packed me lunch, and it wasn't what I wanted, so I still have it with me. And uh, so they said, okay, how much do you have? Well, we have five loaves of bread. We have two fish. And again, they're coming back to Jesus to say, see, I can't do it. You told me to feed them. Look, this is all we have. We can't do it. I tried to tell you that, Jesus. 
right? You're getting frustrated. You're probably smelling the bread now and the fish, and you want it yourself. How am I supposed to do this? So they said, that's all it is. And Jesus doesn't answer them. Jesus just gives them more instructions. He said, okay, thanks for the bread. Thanks for the fish. I need you to go have people sit down. They've been on their feet all day listening to me. You need to go have them sit down. Break them up in groups, right? He says, groups of 50. So they sat down in groups of hundreds and fifties. And verse 41 is the powerful story. Many of you already know this story. Taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gives thanks and he breaks the bread. And as he breaks the bread, he has the disciples stand in line, right? One by one. Come on up here. Grab a basket. All right? He breaks the bread and the fish and he gives them that. All right. Go feed that group over there. Next group comes up. Next group comes up. And each one of them, you can tell, right? If you were in that position, the cynicism, right? Because now I'm starting to feed the crowd, but I can't feed the whole crowd. This is not going to end well because half the people are going to go away hungry and the other half are going to get fed. And so you're frustrated probably with God, though you're still curious. Like, what's going to happen here? And we know what happens. They keep going and they keep going. And each disciple had his own basket. And he brought it back empty, and Jesus refilled it. And then Jesus, and then the disciple brought it to a group of people and fed them. And what happened? He gave them to his disciples to distribute to the people. He also divided the two fish. Verse 42, what happened? Everybody ate and they were full. But that's not enough, right? Jesus is trying to prove a point here. Not only did they eat and were full, what happened to verse 43? The disciples, he sends them back out with an empty basket, and they each have to pick up a basket full of the bread. It's like Jesus is proving a point. Don't ever ask me how again. Do you know who I am? In fact, the same story is in John. I think it's John chapter 6, and it talks about this story. And in the same chapter, later on, Jesus says, I am the bread of of life. In other words, if I tell you to do something, stop asking how and remember who. If I've told you to do it, I'm going to make sure you can get it done. But you got to step out in faith. Stop asking how. So he proves this point and he gives another lesson in stewardship, right? Nothing is to be wasted. We're not going to leave things by the side. We're going to take care of this. We're going to uh, make sure that we're wise with our resources. So they pick up the 12 basketfuls. And Ellen White tells us that they sent that food home with the crowd. The number of the men who had eaten was 5,000. This is a powerful story. And I want to share real quick just seven lessons. I'm not going to get into each one. I know that sounds overwhelming. But these are the seven takeaways that I got here as I was hearing this, Okay. The first one is that following Jesus is very inconvenient. If you want a convenient life, don't follow Jesus. Because he's going to ask you things that you don't want to do, that get in your way, that cost you your time, that cost you your resources, that put you in touch with people that you're not comfortable with. If you really want to follow Jesus, he's going to make you uncomfortable and he's going to make you inconvenient. Because you have to work on his schedule not your own. Are you with me? That's uncomfortable for us. So I'm telling you right now, don't follow Jesus unless you're willing to, have, to be inconvenienced. Don't do it. But if you're going to follow Jesus, get ready to have an inconvenient life. That's just the reality. Number two, being realistic can get in the way of being redeemed. Being realistic can get in the way of being redeemed. In other words, if we just focus on the fact that we don't have the resources to do what God has asked us to do, I'm just being realistic here. We're going to miss out on the blessing God has, not only for us, but for all the people around us as well. We're actually derelict in our duty when we do that. It is important to have a realistic idea, but it is always important to recognize that God is probably going to interrupt that idea. Are you with me? So you can't just be realistic if you're going to be following Jesus. You're not going to experience the redemption that he's calling you to. Number three, with Jesus, every command is a promise. Every command is a promise. If he tells you to do something, he will empower you to get it done. But you got to step out in faith first. 
right? He's waiting for the action. So every time he commands you to do something, and we're thinking about how, really what we need to do is just go forth and, and see what happens. And God's going to make it happen. He has the resources to make it happen. Number four, sometimes we think we're waiting on Jesus when really he's waiting on us. You give them something to eat. Sometimes we think that we're just waiting on the word from God and from on high when really God has been saying, I've been telling you what to do. You give them something to eat. I'm going to be there with you. I'll empower you. But we can justify a lot as a church and as an individual in saying that we are waiting on God. Do you hear me? We can say that we're waiting on God when really God has given us our marching orders. And he's told us what to do, and we're just not doing it. Number five, when the disciples brought the little they had to Jesus, he multiplied their resources, right? In other words, if you give what you have, you're going to be shocked at what happens with it. If you give of your time, if you give of your resources, if you actually trust Jesus with those things, he is going to multiply them so long as you are doing what he asked you to do. Number six, remember that the disciples were hungry, right? The disciples had to share their food first before they were fed. How can we apply this? Well, let's, let's talk church business for a minute. Sometimes we think we have to put the church first, and then we can meet the needs of the community. The lesson that I'm seeing here in this is that in feeding the community, we are fed ourselves. In providing for the needs of the people around us, we find that our needs are met. We need to be outward focused if we really want to have the blessing of God internally. Do you hear me? That's as a church, and that's also as an individual. Sometimes the blessing is in service to others, we find that we have what we need. If your faith is weak, I know this sounds crazy, but if your faith is weak, if you're really struggling in your time with God, one of the best things you can do is start serving and reaching out to other people. If you don't feel strong enough to give a Bible study, maybe the best thing you need to do is reach out and give a Bible study. That's how Jesus strengthens your faith. It's in the exercising of your faith that you get strengthened. Share your food first, and then you will be fed. And number seven, and this is obvious, but it has to be said, nothing is too small for God to use. Nothing is too small for God to use. This was five loaves and two fish for 15,000, give or take, people. That is not possible. We know that. This is what we call a miracle but it was not too small for God to use. Let me put this in a more practical way. When we talk about reaching out and giving people something to eat, God has placed people in your lives. He's given you a basket to be filled with his bread to give to other people in your lives. And you may think it's not enough or it's not good enough or you're not good enough. So we can come up with all these reasons why we are not giving people something to eat. Some of us might think, I'm too old. I'm useless now. I've heard this before. I don't have any use anymore because I'm too old or I'm too sick. My response, according to Scripture, is give them something to eat. Guess what? If you're old, there's a good chance that there are medical professionals who have to work with you on a regular basis. You have an opportunity to minister to those people. You have an opportunity to speak life into their lives. Do you hear me? Maybe some of you are saying, I'm too young. We have some kids here. I'm too young. God's not really asking me to do anything. And the response from Scripture is, give something to eat. Do you know this whole miracle happened because of a young boy who had brought the food and gave of his resources? You are not too young to help people. You're not too young to help people. Maybe sometimes we think, I'm not smart enough. This is a very common one when we talk about sharing our faith. I don't know it well enough to share it with someone else. The best way to learn is to teach. Because then you find out what you do know, and you find that God will give you a lot of that. But you also find what you don't know, and it should motivate you to seek Scripture yourselves. 
So if you're not on fire for the word, maybe you need to share that faith with somebody else. And guess what? All of a sudden, you're going to be thirsting and hungering yourself for the word. No one is too dumb to share their faith. Maybe you think, again, I'm too weak. I'm just not strong enough to do what you're asking me, God. But if Jesus commands or promises, he's saying, I will be your strength. In fact, I want you to recognize your weakness. Maybe you think, I'm too poor. Let's think of this in a practical way. God, I cannot help someone else. I don't have enough money myself. That's exactly what was happening here. I don't have enough food to feed myself. How can I feed someone else? But in feeding someone else, the disciples were fed, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, right? They had leftovers. No one is too poor to serve God. I'm too sad. I'm just having so much going on in my life. I can't see past myself. I'm too sad. I can't do it right now. Sorry, God. And Jesus' response simply is, you give them something to eat. You don't have to have it all together. Your faith does not have to be strong in order for you to reach out to somebody else. In fact, in the sharing of your weak faith, your faith will be strengthened. Some might say, I'm too busy. I simply don't have enough time. I would question you, busy with what? Is it worth it? We can always be busy. We can always find time to fill our schedules. But even in our busyness, Scripture tells us, as you are going, fulfill the Great Commission. Preach, teach, make disciples. You are all going somewhere in your lives every day. I mean, you may be at home, but you're probably interacting with somebody. I challenge you, if you don't think that you really interact with people, to keep track some week. And write down every person you have an interaction with, online, on your phone, in person, at the gas station, at the store. And you will be shocked how many people that you come across every single day. And someone there in that week, Jesus might be asking you, you give them something to eat. Be it spiritual, be it physical. Jesus is always putting that in our place. I'm too important. I've got too much important work. I can't be bothered with this kind of stuff. We know the answer to that. I'm the one in need. I'm too poor. I'm the one in need. How can I help somebody else? That's not my calling. I'm not called to do this. Are you a Christian? If you are a Christian, you are called to give them something to eat. That's the reality of the situation. There is no excuse for us to not be giving people something to eat. That's the message that I got from this scripture. And that's challenging to me. I'm not sharing this from up here. I'm sharing this with you that I am challenged at all times to be inconvenienced and to see where God will interrupt my life so that I can save somebody else's life. i got to share one story and then I'm done. In China, uh, I've gone to China a couple times. The second time I was in China... I had uh, this experience. We were teaching English during, during the, the week, and on Sabbath, we would have to take two buses to get to the church. There were not very many churches, of course, in China, and so we had to go across the city. Well, we were always late to this church for one reason or another, <laughs> and I hate being late. You might not believe that, but I hate being late. And I was late a lot, and I did not want to be late. Kyra's not so worried. No, she is. But but, but Kyra's relaxed about it. I get stressed out about it, right? And so that's something that God has had to work with in me. And so one week, I said, you know what? We are not going to be late, Kyra. We are going to get to church on time. This is going to happen. I don't care what happens. We're going to make it to church on time. So I woke up super early, and I got ready to go. And I told Kyra to be ready at a certain time. And Kyra was, um, we were not married at the time. She was living in the next apartment complex over. And I had to go down six flights of stairs and up six flights of stairs. And I knocked on her door. And I don't even know if you opened it or someone you lived with opened it. But guess what? Kyra was not ready. And I said, you know what? That's okay. That's why we got here so early. This is fine. Like, we can still be on time. So Kyra gets ready. And I still look at my watch. And I'm like, not bad. Like, we can still be early, maybe at least on time. So we rush down our six flights of stairs. We have to go out of this giant apartment complex and wait at the bus stop. And we get there, and we wait, and we wait, and we wait, 
And the buses don't run on a schedule there. They just come when they come. That's just how it is, right? So we're waiting so long that our friends, our Chinese friends, came down. They had not been in a hurry. They were not in a rush. They did not care to be on time. And they ambled their way over, and they were standing with us. And I'm getting frustrated. All of this work, and now I'm going to be at the same time as these people who did not try so hard. So frustrating. So we're waiting, we're waiting, and then all of a sudden, finally a bus comes around the corner, and the bus is packed. Standing room only. And I'm like, I don't care. I'm going. We got to go. So I tell Kyra, let's get on. We pay, we get up, and we're standing there, right? And the bus is moving so slowly, and it's packed. There's no space, and I'm fuming. I'm so frustrated because now we're about, we're going to be late. Like, we're definitely going to be late. I failed again. And as we're sitting there, we pull up to one stop, and I'm watching out the window while I'm standing there, and I look out the window. Our Chinese friends decided not to get on that bus. They said, we'll wait for the next one. I'm like, fine, you be late, whatever. I'm standing there looking out the window, and our friends go by in a totally empty bus, waving at us (laughs) while sitting down. And at that point, I'm about to blow a gasket. I'm just done. And I'm fuming. I'm like, you know, I'm mad. I'm like, God, why are you doing this? Like, I'm trying to be faithful to you. I'm trying to be on time. This matters to me. And I didn't have any answer from God at the moment, and I'm standing there frustrated, not talking with Kyra, when all of a sudden I hear behind me someone say hi. And in China, you don't hear people say hi very often, right? Um, And so I ignored it at first, but my ears locked in, and then someone said hello again. So I turned and looked around and looked down, and there was this really short young lady who said hi to me. And I'm like, hi? Hi? Oftentimes in China, they did not initiate conversations with us. They were quite shy of us, right? We were quite shy too, so it's understandable. So I didn't know who this girl was, and she starts asking me, where are you going? And red flags are popping up, right? Because in China, you can't just be publicly a believer. That's not how it works over there. You have to kind of keep everything on a down low. Even when you're doing evangelism, you have to be very intentional about it. This girl's asking me, where am I going? And if I tell her I'm going to church and she's like some sort of plant because they're following the Westerners around, like I could put other people in danger. So I don't know if I should even tell her where I'm going. So I prayed about it. I said, okay, you know what? I'm just going to be honest. I said, we're going to church. And her eyes lit up. She said, really? I want to come to church. Again, red flags. This usually doesn't happen. Something's going on here. I don't know what should happen. So I said, okay, cool. You know, uh, next week. We can do it next week. That's fine, you know. And I figure she'll forget or whatever. She said, no, no, I'm busy. I'm free now. I can come with you right now. What do you mean you can come to church with me? So we started talking a little bit more, and she started the conversation a little earlier saying, I want to give you a gift, which I thought was very strange. So we chose a very public place, and I said, okay, I'll meet you tomorrow. Kyra and I will meet you tomorrow in this very public place. Don't hurt us. You can give us a gift there. And then she invites herself to church. And so we, I'm praying about it, and I said, okay, if you really want to come, you can come. That's fine. So we start talking on our way to church. It's a long church service. And she starts sharing, and she says, there are so many of us here in China who are hungry. That's what she said. There are so many of us who are hungry for truth, hungry for God, but we don't really know where to go or what to do. And I was like, what is going on here? This is crazy. And so we get to the church service, and we get upstairs, and there's a Chinese service and an English service. She decides to do the English service. So I'm like, great. She's not going to understand anything we're talking about. She sits through the English service, and it was about being fishers of men. And so, again, I don't think she understands anything that's being talked about. We get to the end of the service, and I go up and I want to ask her a little bit about it. I say, what do, you, what do you think? And she said, I'm the fish. What? She said, I'm the fish. You're the fishers of men. I'm the fish. I was like, what in the world? This girl literally evangelized herself. <laughs> I did everything wrong, and she still landed in the boat. I didn't even want to reach out to anybody that day. I wanted to be left alone. And here she was coming to church. And as we started talking, it was just this most profound experience because she said, if there hadn't been two of you, I wouldn't have had the courage to talk. And then she said, if you had been sitting down, I wouldn't have had the courage to talk. And it hit me through this whole thing that if I had been on time, 
this girl would maybe never know Jesus. If I had got on the right bus, the convenient bus, like my friends, she never would have met us. If we hadn't been crowded, if I hadn't been frustrated, if I hadn't been inconvenienced in every single way, this girl may not have had the opportunity to hear the gospel. And that was just this moment in my life where God peeled back the curtains. You don't get to see it very often. But every once in a while, you get to see how God is using everything for His good. Sometimes, even when we're not willing, He's still using us. Imagine when we are willing. Give them something to eat. That girl's name, by the way, she chose her English name. It was Destiny. I mean, that doesn't even sound like it. It sounds like a made-up story when I say it like that. But Destiny transformed my life and helped me to understand that there is nothing random. And that if we are willing to be intentional, then God is going to put people in our way at all times. In fact, the whole scripture, all the gospels, Jesus is always on his way somewhere else when an interruption happens. 90% of his miracles, I'm telling you, happened on his way to his appointments. So Jesus was probably always late, and he was probably always frustrating people because he didn't keep to the schedule. He didn't stick to the plan. He saw what God was placing in his path as he was going, and he did what was necessary in that moment. I'm challenging you as we finish right now, to think, to pray, to be open to giving someone something to eat. Even if it's inconvenient, even if it is scary, even if it doesn't make sense, you give them something to eat. Each one of us is a disciple. God has created you with a unique personality, a unique life background, you can connect with people that I cannot connect with. You can connect with people that the person next to you cannot connect with. There's a reason why every disciple got a basket and every disciple ministered to a group of people. We can't be expecting one or two or three people to be doing the work that is God's work. He says to you, give them something to eat. Who do you feel called to reach? Who do you feel called to touch? Because the passions that are laid on your heart are different from the passions that are laid on mine. That's intentional. God is calling you to be a part of the sacred work, and I challenge you to give people something to eat this week.